In the last few weeks, our gospel readings have all been, been about love and forgiveness. A couple of weeks ago, we heard the story where Jesus forgave Peter for denouncing him three times by affirming his love and forgiveness three times. Peter, do you love me? Then feed my sheep. And last week, we were given a new commandment, to love one another as I have loved you. And we have thought about what it is to love one another as Jesus loves, not that flippant love that we can often talk about, the love of home, I love that TV program, I'd love a cup of tea. All things we do love, but not quite what Jesus was meaning. And we have thought about the love that Jesus commands us to perform, not a material love or even a romantic love, but a love that is at first sacrificial. Christ loved us so much that he gave up his life so that we might have life in all its abundance. And we are called to love others in this way, to give up our prejudices, our likes and our dislikes, to love others. A love that is not just directed at those whom we love anyway, our family and our friends, but one that costs us, changes us, challenges us. A love directed towards those marginalised by society. And secondly, a love that is unconditional. There is nothing that we can do to deserve the love of God. And conversely, there's nothing we can do to lose the love of God. He is a constant, and his love comes with no condition. It is there for all people to turn to. Our choice is whether we truly turn to him or not. And whether we do that at age five or 95, he still welcomes us with open arms. Our challenge is to welcome others in the same way, with open arms, no matter how unlovable, how unsanitary, how ungodly we might think they are. And thirdly, a love that is practical, that we meet the needs of others in every way we can. Yes, with money, but also with our time and our energy, caring and doing just as Jesus did. A new commandment to love as he has loved us, sacrificially, unconditionally, and practically. And these few weeks follow on from one another. And as we have just said, we're about to celebrate Ascension on Thursday. And time is running out. Jesus wants us to know what is most important before he ascends back forever to the Father. But he also wants to assure us that he will never leave us completely. Whilst we may not see God now in a physical body, God will be with us in the form of another, the Holy Spirit, the Advocate, the Helper, to come and teach us everything, he says. And then he leaves by giving them peace, not as the world gives. Passing the peace, something we do every time we meet for communion. And I wonder if you've ever thought about why we do it. The ritual of giving of peace, the peace of the Lord, goes back to that very first Easter, as we've just heard. Peace be with you, he says, as he appears to the disciples in the upper room after his resurrection. Peace I leave with you, he says, in our gospel reading this morning. He then sent them out to bring peace to the world by forgiving, forgiving sins in his name. It's interesting to know that in the early days of the Christian church, the peace was given not as a handshake, but as a kiss. The kiss of peace is spoken about at the end of several letters in our New Testament. In the early church, all who received and gave the kiss of peace then received the body and blood of Christ in the sacrament as we still do today. In their gatherings, and still today in the Eastern Church, the kiss begins at the altar and is passed around the church. 
Only those who receive and give the kiss are welcomed to the Lord's table. In a document called the Didache from the early 3rd century AD, <clears throat> we read of a scene where the kiss of peace comes to a halt as two people refuse to kiss each other and therefore pass it on. There's a disagreement. We're not told what the disagreement was, but it's probably much like some of the disagreements we have between people in congregations such as ours today. The service then stops and the presiding minister has to leave the altar and goes to where the kiss is blocked. And only after reconciliation did the peace continue on its way around. And only then does the liturgy proceed. It says much about how the early Christians lived in a congregation. To them, the peace of God was a real thing, expected to be received by everyone and shared by everyone. There was to be no withholding of forgiveness between the gathered flock. If two people could not share the peace, no one could until the two were brought together. Now, of course, we are talking about the Middle Eastern and continental world in our gospel this morning, not the very English world that we live in this morning. It's still not quite the right done thing to go around kissing everyone. After all, we're not French. So in our civilized and maybe slightly uptight way, we shake hands. And maybe that is why it has become more of a ritual of greeting our friends rather than passing God's peace, forgiveness, reconciliation, and most importantly, the Holy Spirit. But maybe now we can be more aware of how important passing God's peace to one another is. And then at the end of the service, the doors are thrown open and the peace and the Spirit is taken out into the world. And that's when it becomes a bit trickier. We can love one another in here in this building, but how do we take that love through the door and outside? It is excruciatingly difficult sometimes to talk to people about our faith. We get tongue-tied, we feel foolish, we feel that no one could possibly be convinced by what we have to say. And maybe that's true, but as this gospel tells us, uh, our reading from Acts tells us, their hearts can be opened by the Spirit. And maybe those people are just waiting for you to put into words, or better still, into action, the meaning of our faith in Jesus Christ. We don't have to convert people. The Spirit does that. All we have to do is speak honestly and openly about what faith means to us. So also in our, in our reading this morning from Acts, we hear about the meeting between Paul and Timothy and a woman called Lydia in the city of Philippi. We're told that Lydia is a dealer in purple cloth. These days, we're very used to being able to get any colour, clothing or cloth that we want, but it's obviously not always been like that. Dyes were natural, not synthetic. And the dye for purple was made from the juice found in a minute quantities in shellfish. It took thousands of crustaceans to make a yard or two of purple cloth. It was very expensive, worth its weight in silver, we are told. It was a statement of status and wealth, the Gucci handbag or the Rolex watch of Roman times. But purple wasn't just an indicator of wealth. It was a symbol of political power. The more important you were as a Roman senator, the more purple decoration you had on your tunic. The emperor, and only the emperor, would wear a toga made entirely of purple cloth. It was the colour of the Roman elite. You might like to ponder why a bishop, a servant, might wear purple, but perhaps that's a sermon for another time. In a way which isn't explained, Paul felt that the Spirit had forbidden them to go back to Asia. And wherever he tries to go, he feels he's being rebuffed, until finally he's called in a dream to Macedonia. And he goes across land, across sea and land, to Philippi, on the outer fringe of the Jewish diaspora, where he can find no gospel to preach in. 
Philippi had remained an insignificant village until Emperor Augustus rediscovered it as an ideal place for retired army officers who had faithfully served him. And it became a cosmopolitan town for the elite, with over 50% of the population being pensioned colonists and merchants, and the rest being service providers and farmers. So having no synagogue, it is outside of the city walls that Paul and Timothy have to go to find someone to talk to. On the day of the Sabbath, the only place of prayer they can find is outside the city gate by the river. Not a large crowd, as was usual for Paul, but a small group of women, but a group who are willing to hear. And here he meets Lydia, this rich, confident woman. Lydia, who has had her heart opened by the Holy Spirit so that she can hear the message that Paul is about to bring. The Lord opened her heart to listen eagerly to what Paul had to say. Paul, who seemed this time to be on a mission that was going nowhere, meets the woman who will become the linchpin of the church in Philippi. Lydia will become the first church leader in Europe. Other churches give him grief, but Philippi, Philipp, the Philippians are a constant source of support to him, financial as well as spiritual. His letter to them is one of the warmest of the epistles. He's founded a church in what seemed like an unlikely place, and it has become a great success. And so here is the inspiration for us. Inside this building, we share and share love and forgiveness between us. And here in this building, we receive the Holy Spirit in the form of the peace. At the table, we receive the body and blood of Christ to feed us and sustain us in our mission. And then we go outside the city walls, through the door of this church, and we take with us the love of Christ, which is sacrificial, unconditional, and practical, and we share it with all we meet. In us, they will see that the love of God does not judge them for their misdoings, their lack of faith, their way of life, but shows all people through us that God can and does love everyone. And all we do every Sunday is nothing more than come together to celebrate that love. May the peace of God be always with you. Amen.